So now in our previous video, we ended with the establishment of the idea of genetic equilibrium, the fact that genotype frequencies and allele frequencies don't change over time so long as there's no evolutionary force acting upon that specific population. This idea was developed independently and sort of codependently by two separate individuals and is termed the Hardy-Weinberg principle. And that's what we're going to entitle our next flowchart. So many people have a good idea of what the Hardy-Weinberg principle is about, but I think it's important to understand the purpose of it. Why you study something that's a bit contrived, that's not seen in real life, it's very important to understand the contribution that these two individuals came up with by establishing something so simplistic that it doesn't happen in real life, yet it still provides a powerful tool for population geneticists to work off of. So let me give you a bit of background information on this principle. So we'll start this first part of the flow chart as a background. So let's look at this principle. What we have to understand about this principle is a couple of key points. We have to first understand that um, there's a, a lot of ifs involved. So if the population that we're looking at, so if the population, remember we're talking about populations, not individuals, is what we would consider large. So I'm going to write that in large letters. If the population is large, we can state the following with confidence. And this is what Hardy Weinberg said. Then inheritance, which is the passing on of traits and genes and um, DNA, inheritance alone. Okay, so then inheritance alone doesn't, does not, doesn't cause change in what do you think? What is staying the same in genetic equilibrium doesn't cause change in what we've talked about in a lot so far in allele frequency. So let's repeat that. If population is large, then inheritance alone, aka the passing on of genes, doesn't cause change in allele frequencies. We're going to see that as we move forward. Now, this is an important principle because it actually gives us an explanation, and we'll say it explains, the Hardy-Weinberg principle does, it explains why dominant alleles, okay, dominant alleles are not, okay, are not um, always more common, are not always more common than their recessive counterparts and the recessive alleles. So it explains why dominant alleles are not always more common than recessive alleles. We'll look at this definition again. If population, this background point, if population is large, then inheritance alone doesn't cause change in allele frequencies. So if we imagine that in a huge population like the human population, the fact that something like, um, remember that dwarfism dominant trait that led, led to achondroplasia, that dwarfism trait from human genetics, go look back at it, that was a dominant allele that caused that. And you might be wondering, well then how is it possible that everybody mostly has recessive alleles at that achondroplasia trait gene. Well, that's because of the fact that if the population is large enough, then inheritance alone is not going to change the allele frequencies. That recessive allele that's good, actually, in that situation will just stay there. It will stay constant. Its allele frequency will not change. So that's a good example. Any dominant autosomal disorder is a good example of this. And finally, uh, last background point to understand is the following. The Hardy-Weinberg principle, um, it is a great way um, to describe genetics, okay? It describes genetics of what we consider non-evolving, okay? Non-evolving, so this is a bit uh, important to understand, of non-evolving populations. So, you might be wondering, why would I possibly, as I'm studying evolution for whatever reason, need to know the genetics of things that don't evolve? That doesn't make sense. Why would I need to know the situations that are going to create what we would consider an ideal, uh, a Hardy-Weinberg, an ideal population? Okay, we're looking at ideal populations, or ideal, not populations, better word would be situation in which there is no evolution working. Why would that be necessary? 
even though something like that is rarely, if at all, rarely ever seen in the world. Okay, rarely ever seen in the world. What is the purpose? Those are great questions that you are asking, and I shall answer them by telling you right now the purpose of this principle. And it's an important idea that a lot of just knowledge gaining is important to, uh, that gives you an idea of what it means to understand knowledge in terms of biology. The purpose of this is very simple. If you have a non-evolving population, this ideal situation that's rarely ever seen, it seems like it's absolutely unnecessary, you know what you get out of the Hardy-Weinberg principle? You get what we refer to as a baseline, meaning that the Hardy-Weinberg principle, in terms of its purpose, is the following. It provides a baseline. This is a key idea here. Provides a baseline for comparison. It is a powerful tool in which, remember how we kept on talking about normal versus abnormal in human genetics? Well, this is the same idea, but in evolutionary genetics and in population genetics, we can look at a normal, a perfect, ideal, hardy Weinberg population, and then look and compare a real-life population and say, where is it different? Where are we seeing deviations from hardy Weinberg? That's where variation is acting. That's where evolution is acting. That's where we see differences. Because when we notice these differences, when we are doing what we would say in this following format, when this allows us to determine what this all of this allows us uh, to determine what forces okay what forces are indeed acting on a population are acting on the specific population at hand because if you know what forces are not acting on it aka the forces that are seen within hardy weinberg principle like non-evolving populations you are providing a sort of source and information which you can see and you can say oh this is where this specific population is different than what i would expect in a hardy weinberg population and thus i have something to base my comparison off of this is a powerful powerful tool that gives you um, one last idea that we can state here something known as the hardy weinberg hw equilibrium okay something we've already established, but I want to re-emphasize it. Um, it will just be defined, uh, written out as HWE from this point forward. The Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium states the following. The Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, a powerful, powerful statement, states that the frequencies of alleles and genotypes, okay, so the allele frequency and the genotypic frequency. So the frequency of alleles and genomes will indeed, of course, remain constant, okay? Remember how we kept on saying they don't change? Well, uh, another way to say don't change is remain constant. Frequencies in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium populations remain constant over generations. Okay. Again, these are contrived examples. Okay, These are examples that are not seen oftentimes in the rare, real world, but they provide a point of comparison. Okay, And a key idea with the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium that we're going to be really looking at as we move forward is that the population itself that's in this um, scenario of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, um, it absolutely needs to be mating okay, randomly needs to be mating randomly. We're going to talk about that a little bit more as we move forward. I'm not going to elaborate much on this. And there actually has to be, and there has to be, and no random, what we would call uh, agents. No random agents. Okay, we'll refer to these agents in quotes for right now since we don't really know what we're talking about. Can act on it. And when we say it, we're referring to the population. Population needs to be mating randomly, and no random agents can act on it. Go back to this and notice that this is an ideal situation, the Hardy-Weinberg principle, and it's rarely ever seen in the world. What can you state is, is seen in the world based off of this information I gave you? In the world, we do see evolving populations. We see 
not randomly mating, but non-random mating, and we do see random agents acting on populations. But how can we figure out which ones are actually acting on the population? What is the population actually doing that's different than Hardy-Weinberg? Well, you actually have to know Hardy-Weinberg. You have to know the norm before you understand the abnorm, the abnormal, and we're going to be looking at that as we move forward through this lecture. In the next video, we're going to just look at the very famous Hardy-Weinberg equation to really drive home the idea of this principle.